you, you see, I, I'm talking about something. I'm talking about somebody about whom I'm totally and unapologetically unapolog passionate. Um, I say somebody, but really it's two somebodies. Um, it's Serpent of God, John Randall Bradburn, but it's also my blessed father Francis. Um, in my mind, the two are inextricably linked. JRB being the modern day 20th century manifestation of Blessed Francis, uh, the action man, uh, the ultimate implementer, uh, for me and many others, the definer of what it is to be a Franciscan. The big, if not the huge, if not the impossible to solve problem for me, is how is it possible to be a Franciscan in the 21st century? How is it possible for me to, I don't know, have the courage to carry such a label, proclaiming it publicly? Uh, I, must, I must be totally bonkers, uh, nuts no less. But then a moment of realization, if you will, all is okay with the world. All Franciscans are totally bonkers. It's a fact, and I think I'm correct in saying, and I don't have this fact checked, that there are more Franciscan martyrs than any other group of people. And I think more saints too. And why? Well, the, the problem is <laughs> Franciscans can't just walk away. They have to stick their faces into areas where, as the very inaccurate saying goes, where angels fear to tread. Poverty, humility, and obedience. Just thinking about these three words makes me feel totally, totally weak. I have a towel cross around my neck and it's there 24 seven. And I, I, I never take it off. Uh, and I'm always conscious of those three words and the three knots in the cord around my neck. And I need help big time. What are the, do you remember the lyrics to that wonderful song, You Raise Me Up? You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You see, there's absolutely no doubt in this, our Western consumerist society, there is no doubt we live in a blame society. In this United Kingdom, all four nations that make up the kingdom, blame reigns supreme um, within, within and I don't know, within and throughout the political and social and family system. The dynamic, if all, if anything, is all about whose fault it is. I want to ask you, have you ever come across the theories about middle children, middle children of three or middle children of five? The middle one is always different, always different from the siblings often a loner, often a dreamer, and always independent from the outset, and always the one that gets the blame. Any of you who are middle children of three will know exactly what I'm talking about. And by the way, I'm a middle child of three, and I always got the blame. Always in trouble, never quite towing the line, always just a bit different. And the trouble is that my wife is also in the middle of three. On paper, at least, this should be a very interesting dynamic. Um, but 40 we 41 years on from our splendid nuptial mass, we're still being different. Not quite as confrontational as we used to be. And no longer, no, not no longer, always not conformist as others might be. Although we seem to have given up the blame game between us and there's no more shouting, not my fault, whenever we feel the need. John was the middle of five. 
And I'm sure that all of you know enough, more than enough to agree that John was indeed different. Very different from his siblings, very different from others at school. And guess what? I've only discovered this today. I follow Father Richard Ryan quite carefully. And I've just discovered today that he's a middle of three. And surprise, surprise, I'm not surprised. Um, so I'm beginning to think it's time for a middles support group, something I might talk about later. <laughs> time to get to the point. Well, maybe a point. I blame John Randall Bradburn. I blame him for turning my spiritual life upside down. And I blame him for making my life more difficult. How did I come across, John? How do we meet, so to speak? Do you believe in coincidences? I don't. Not anymore. What I do believe in is that with me at least, there's a sort of, I don't know, a crazy guardian angel. The one who cares for me quietly creates a whole range of complex situations and events. And then, in the peculiar way that I'm sure angels have, waits to see which I go for, whilst I continue thinking that I've got free will. Now, I can be exact. I was walking down Piccadilly in London. This was a few years ago. With a bit of time to kill, and I headed for Hatchard's bookshop, which I'm sure many of you know, intent on an hour or so of quiet and browsing. Eventually up to the fifth floor in the religion and history, browsing the shelves. No ideas, just waiting to see if anything jumped out at me. No prizes. You can guess what jumped out. And yes, it was Father Dove's book, Strange Vagabond of God. Photograph on the cover, long haired guy, hair the length of about what I had at art school. Looked at the back cover and some bits inside, noted that he'd been killed, murdered, martyred on the 5th of September 1979. A coincidence, maybe, but the 5th of September is my birthday, and 1979 was my 37th birthday. Nonetheless, none less a connection, albeit a tenuous one, with John, and part of the reason why I actually bought the book. <laughs> um, and every birthday since that day, what, maybe 20 odd years ago, it's a day when I pray a little more intensely for John and the cause. I duly bought the book, I read it, and then I read it again, and then I read it again, and then I read it again, and probably again after that, and I've lost count of the number I bought. John Dove should have been grateful. I single-handedly sustained his royalties for years. The Bradburn effect was in full swing. I just kept giving them away. There was a time that I thought I was a Benedictine. As a matter of interest, have any of you compared the length of the rule of St. Benedict with the first and early rules of St. Francis? Benedict wanted to, I don't know, he filled a huge volume. The Benedictine rule is it's, it's pretty tough in places and certainly the section concerning the discipline of boys would certainly draw the attention of child protection agencies these days. Anyway, I decided that the Benedictines collectively were somewhat too clever and intellectual for me. That didn't stop me from spending quite a few years being quite dedicated to Douay Abbey in, um, in Berkshire in England. Eventually though, my love of the old Roman rite took me to St. Michael's Abbey in Farnborough. I don't know whether any of you know it, a wonderful place. Just what is it about the Latin mass that holds so many of us in its power? 
Abbott Cuthbert at Farnborough is said to be one of the experts worldwide on Gregorian chant. Add to this the absolute rule of silence in the Abbey Church. Silence as you go in, maintained until you step outside again. Quiet, calm, so essential for that essential link, that connection with the divine. I know that the voice of God is always there, but sometimes I find it hard to unscramble it from the junk noise that's going on all the time. Anyway, definitely not a Benedictine. I've got the wrong roots. Having said that, I'm blaming John Randall Bradburn for opening the Franciscan gates and giving me those first sightings. John Dove's book showed me that this guy who was different, very different, dared to be different. Okay, compared to me, alarmingly middle class, alarmingly posh, private schools on another planet, as far as I was concerned, as a young person. Was this what Franciscans were like? I didn't know any Franciscans. But here I was absorbing every word of John, uh, of, uh, of John Dubb's book using this single source to tell me about this quite crazy bloke. Incidentally, that long hippie hair tied back with the bandana. Even there, J.R.B. had got things flipped upside down. I had the shoulder length hair in my late teens, required style at art school. Captain Bradburn in the mid twenties, an entirely different image. By the time I was 25, I was in a pinstripe suit, starched collar, silk tie. How I'd like to have that shoulder length hair back. It's too late. It's got too thin. It just wouldn't work anymore. Back to my narrative. Then my reading took me to Francis and I sort of fell in love. Here at the source of Francis Franciscanism was the original crazy guy. The one who dared to be different, who dared to love God unconditionally, dared to tell others about it, dared to show others the way, dared to be a sort of precursor, an earlier version of John Bradburn. Excuse me. <laughs> a few weeks ago, in one of my weekly videos in my video blog, I speculated on the, on the purpose of saints. And I just wonder why we have these people that we elevate to extraordinary heights. Because when we give the issue just a little thought, we come to the conclusion that women saints and men saints alike are, as I keep saying, a crazy bunch. They're not just different. Each one of them seems to have a unique path to understanding the love of God. If my memory serves me right, there are somewhere around 400 saints in regular use within the Roman church. I have to speculate what it'd be like if you put them all together in one room. <laughs> I can imagine sort of total mayhem. Each one of them knowing something that I don't. Each one of them so very, very special. A comparison. Put servant of God, John Bradburn, alongside some of these crazy saints. Stand him alongside Blessed Francis himself. What would you see? Well, apart from the fact that Francis would seem to be very tiny, um, you would see laid out before you, I don't know, a sort of road map with directional pointing to this unconditional love of God. I often wonder how did Blessed Francis morph into a young man who attracted followers so easily 
And let's face it, the raw material didn't look too good. He was a spoiled young man and the best of everything that was material. John was no doubt privileged in some ways, but not in quite that same way. What gripped me about John initially was the, the transitions, if you like, from, from school to army, and then that transition that caused him eventually to appear at Matemwa. I'm not, I'm not at all sure that we'll ever understand that transition. And I'm sure there is much scholarship waiting to be done. Are there, I, I wonder, secrets to be unlocked in, in those thousands of poems? There's a couple of lifetimes of work there for somebody. I've already mentioned the word coincidence. And as I say, not long ago, I wrote a piece about coincidence and I came to the conclusion that I didn't any longer believe in it. It, it just doesn't exist. Coincidences for me no longer exist. Walking down Piccadilly, London to Hatchard's bookshop, picking up Father Duff's book. Much like meeting my wife in a way because I met her and within 20 seconds, I knew that my life was going to radically change. Meeting John in Father Duff's book signaled inevitable changes in my life. No choice. No way out, even if I wanted one. I think John went through a similar relationship with coincidence. His global wanderings, all part of the process, something always happened. He would be in dire need. That need would be recognized. Provision would be made. A solution would appear. At this point, I'm, go I'm going to read a little piece from Didier's book, um, because I think it illustrates what, uh, what I've just said. So forgive me, I'm going to pick up the book and I'm going to read from it. His journey in Rome was brief. He visited the Franciscans, who he knew already, spent three nights there. He retraced steps, some of the steps from his 1950s pilgrimage, and left, anxious to find a boat for his ultimate destination. He headed for Ostia, only to find there was no connecting boat from there to Israel. He would have to go to Naples or the Adriatic ports of Barbe or Brindisi. He then set off in a southerly direction, passing near Castle Gandolfo, and decided to pay a visit to the Pope. After spending the night in a copse adjoining the pontifical residence, and bringing himself to the attention of the Italian police, he found himself with a group of pil pil pilgrims in the inner courtyard of the residence. And then he writes this short piece of verse. Oh, we entered the yard, nor feared the guard, with throng thrice hundred three. T'was fulfilled my hope, I for I saw the Pope, but I doubt if he saw me. He had no luck in Naples and walked and hitchhiked his way back across the peninsula to Bari. On arrival in the Apulia provincial capital, the church of St. Nicholas inspired him to verse again. In this great house of God, I'd gladly die and join the soul of Michelangelo. That surely now is with the saints on high, hearing the music of an organ flow, Lord, let me die all things of time, bent on the destiny for which I came, to herald Christ and win my native clime. Interjecting here, we must also remember that Michelangelo was a third order Franciscan. He was no, luck, no, no luckier in Bari than he had been on the West Coast, and no ship was willing to give him a free passage to have here. What then did God have in store for him? Should he continue to Brindisi or head back to Naples? At the end of this August, 1952, John could not make up his mind. He felt worn out by the summer heat and by all the walking. In the event, he decided to head back across the Apennines to Mount Partienio, 
arriving at the beginning of September in a small industrial and commercial town between Avellino and Naples. Once there, he was arrested for vacancy by the Cavanieri, either as a precautionary measure or to provide him with somewhere to spend the night. News travels fast in small towns and John's plight came to the attention of Santina Tuolino. The Tuolino's a wealthy family made a habit of putting up passing vagrants and Signora Tuolino, a kind-hearted mother of eight, explained the situation to her husband, a pilgrim from the Holy Land. He is Christ among us, all the more so since he comes from the Holy Land. She headed straight for the prison, went guarantor for John and took him home. He went willingly, once again offering thanks to Providence. The Chulino house was palatial with a large family. He met the children, including Cusipina, who later founded a missionary congregation in Africa, and Antonio, who was handicapped and loved music. John remembers Sister Cusipina played some tunes for her brother, teaching him the rudiments of recorder playing. He was already asking himself whether God desired his immediate presence in the Holy Land. He settled in with the Giolinos, but wished to contribute to paying his keep and was soon to be seen by the Giolino girls, broom in hand in the local school. Every morning he attended mass, celebrated with Don Elia Ferruni, parish priest, who became fond of John and understood that this young Englishman would not stay indefinitely with the Tulinos and needed somewhere permanent to lay his head. Surely this pious young Englishman could help out their cousin, a young priest of Master Day Parish in Palma, Campania. So it really just makes my point, something always happened. If there is such a person, John was a natural Franciscan. Even before he considered the label, Francis would have recognized him. Francis would have recognized him as one of his own. Francis would have recognized that essential quality, that essential quality that we call love, that much abused word, free, freely used in the modern world, so freely used that its essence has deteriorated. But in John, as in Francis, it was intact and it could be used to describe their relationship with God, with the Holy Trinity, with Jesus, with Jesus the Christ, with his Holy Mother, without fear of the word being in any way misunderstood. John loved. He loved the people of Matemwa. Not a distant love, but a tactile, hand-on love. A love of laughter, a love of kindness. A love that was offered and sustained by his love of Jesus, his blessed mother, and his absolute trust and love of God. He loved the unloved, those that were considered unlovable. And what's more, the unloved loves him in return. So where does this leave me? Floundering around, even struggling with those three seemingly little words, poverty, humility, and obedience. I can only look to John to help me out as I try desperately to understand them in the context of my life. I'm an ecumenical Franciscan, under vows, a dispersed community, a community of prayer, living in a secular society, because let's face it, a secular society is what we're living in. A married man, a grandfather no less. Blame, that's all that's left. Blame, John Bradman led me into this, into this challenging world of St. Francis of Assisi, into a world in which I feel encouraged to challenge, challenge on environmental issues, challenge on animal welfare, on the welfare of the unloved, on the have-nots, challenge the haves, challenging the resource guarders, 
the resource hoarders, the greedy, the princes of the church, the narcissists, the lovers of self and avert display. Be assured, Franciscans are always on the edge, the outer edges of the church, unafraid to step over the line, but quick to step back again before they draw any attention to themselves. I'm a Franciscan, albeit a poor reflection of the real thing, but ever thankful, ever thankful for the roadmap left by John, pointing the way, giving me a 20th century focus, an example from the century in which I grew up and worked, someone to talk to who I understand who would have no trouble understanding me, who I can talk to, and oh yes, I do talk to him. Now I'm going to finish this talk by reading a very short poem. This is my favorite poem. John wrote this on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in 1949. And for me, it tells me an incredible amount about John at that time, but it also resonates with me and what I've been through. And indeed, I'm sure it must resonate with some of you too. So it's my favorite poem. It's quite short. I do not follow thee, O Lord, I seek not to well thy will. And all my life is weariness, and all my love falls ill. And everywhere is emptiness, of which I drink my fill. I do not follow thee, O Lord, but thou dost find me still. Yet do I seek thy face, O Lord, thy wonder I would see. The maker of all loveliness, I cast my cares on thee. This I do by thy grace, dear Lord. Thy spirit follows me. Thank you.